back to Revelation, please. And we're going to look at the most difficult prophecy, according to many scholars, found in the Bible. 8 and 9 of Revelation. It's really talking about the disintegration of the world. First spiritually, then morally, then physically. Going to talk about the end of the world. What will happen in the run-up to the end of the world? Let's notice, this is the seven trumpets. This is where Christ comes as the avenger, not the redeemer, the kinsman avenger. No police forces in old Israel. The kinsman did it. And in the trumpets, there won't be any mention of a lamb, but terrible things, mountain falling into the sea, hail and blood, fire falling on the earth, trees being burned up, demons coming out of the pit. Terrible, terrible things. Let's notice the introduction. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of the saints, went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, hurled it on the earth, and there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. What on earth is that about? You've all heard of Sir Isaac Newton. Many people think he was the greatest scientist that ever lived. He was a very convinced Christian, and he spent probably as much time studying Daniel and Revelation as he did on his science. I have a book at home written by him, Observations on the Prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. And Isaac Newton pointed out correctly that the book of Revelation has much symbolism based on the feasts of Israel, particularly on the feast of the seventh month. Now remember, there were two lots of feasts. Spring feasts, beginning with Passover, then the autumn feasts, climaxing Feast of Tabernacles. So it's springtime, Passover, unleavened bread, Feast of First Fruits, Pentecost, 50 days later. All of which pointed to the first advent. Christ crucified the day of the Passover, rising on the third day when the first fruits sheaf was offered. 50 days later, Pentecost. But what about the feast of the seventh month? Well, they also look back to the cross because in the Old Testament, you read much about the kingdom of God, but it's never separated into two because if Israel had been faithful, there wouldn't have been a gap of thousands of years between the first and the second advents. So the New Testament view is that in the Old Testament, looking forward to the cross, when the kingdom of God would be fulfilled or the prophecies would be fulfilled or the types and symbols would be fulfilled, but at the second advent, they would all be consummated. So the Passover will have another meaning at the end of time when those who receive the mark will be safe for eternity. The angel of wrath will pass over them. There'll be a final Pentecost at the end of time when the true church of God, out of all denominations, that they love Jesus, will sound forth the gospel with great Pentecostal power. But the feast of the seventh month not only looked back to the fulfilment of the cross, but looks forward to the consummation at the second coming. And this passage is using the imagery of the Day of Atonement. And if you're really interested, make sure you're at the City Star Hotel next week at this time. This is the language of the Day of Atonement. That's the only time when incense was put in a censer. The silence. All Israel is poised. The priest has gone into the Most Holy. There's a rope tied on his leg. If he's struck down by God, they'll have to pull him out. They're not allowed to eat. They're not allowed to bathe. The only fast day in Israel not allowed to sex. They're all praying. They're all fearful because they believe that on this day they are sealed for heaven or hell, for eternal life or eternal death, for salvation or damnation. This day they are sealed. That's the Jewish view on the Day of Atonement. And this is using the language of the Day of Atonement 
because the Day of Atonement, pointing very much to the cross of Christ, which opened the door of heaven, but in so doing brought a tremendous responsibility to the world because your responsibility depends on your privileges. To whom much is given, much is expected. That's true at all sorts of levels. You are responsible for everything you've been given. You didn't create the colour of your hair or your IQ. You didn't create your talents. We are receivers and we are only stewards. And the main thing we're stewards of is the gospel. And to whom much is given, much is expected. Same sun, melts wax, hardens clay. When people hear the gospel, they become much better or much worse. John 3 has some very strong verses. He that believeth is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already. He that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. Now, you've got it. But he that believeth not the Son, modern versions correctly translate that line, he that obeyeth not the Son, does not have life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Now, terrible to walk about under the wrath of God. What's the wrath of God? Is he irritable like me? No, it's the inevitable recoil of holiness against evil. The inevitable recoil of holiness against evil. So these verses are pointing forward to Judgment Day, the final antitype of the Day of Atonement, not an investigative judgment, an executive judgment. When the lambs, when the sheep and the goats are separated, when it's shown that some names are in the book of life and other names are in the book of death, when it's shown some have the seal of God and others have the mark of the beast, when some are numbered with the woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and the others are numbered with the whore and sent into the wilderness with Azazel. So having introduced the theme of judgment, the seven trumpets will expand it. Let's read. Then the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. I should have mentioned that in Israel's daily sacrifice service, as soon as the sacrifice was offered on the altar, trumpets blew. So this is a reminder that in view of Calvary, now the trumpets of judgment for those that reject the love of God. For the insane people, because you have to be insane. Sin is insanity. Sin never brings profit. Sin is always a cheat. You remember Abner coming to Job? How are you, my brother? Then he stabs him with his other hand. Remember Job and Sisera? Sisera was a killer, a tyrant. He's tethered out, comes to her, asks her to look after him. She brings him butter, it says, in a lordly dish. Wonderful. He thinks this is great. She's like my mother. He falls asleep. She takes a tent peg and dispatches him. That's sin. Looks good. Lordly dish. How are you, my brother? <laughs> sin is deceptive. You never win. It always promises you win or you wouldn't do it. Hey, this will be great. No, it will be damning. Sin is suicide. And so the trumpets are warning messages of judgments that will come during the Christian era before the end in the hope that some will wake up, return to sanity. Life is so much better as a Christian. You don't have to be in fear about yourself or about others or events. You're in tune with the greatest power in the universe. You know all things work together for good. You know you're accepted in God. You know you have the verdict of the last judgment. You know you have eternal life. Who wouldn't be a Christian if they understood it? But people are stupid. And sometimes what C.S. Lewis said is so true. Pain is God's megaphone to a deaf world. Pain is God's megaphone to a deaf world. So the trumpets are pain. What God will permit to happen through the Christian era on those rejecting his offers. He wants to save them. You know, forest fires can fructify some seeds in the forest that the genial rays of the sun can never fructify. But a fire can do it. Fire goes through, you go through the forest. Hey, look, new life. These seeds after a fire. Yes, sometimes the fire of God can fructify 
buried seeds in the heart. So, let's read them. <coughs> the first angel sounded his trumpet. There came hail and fire mixed with blood and it was hurled down upon the earth. A third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees, all the green grass. The second angel sounded his trumpet. Something like a huge mountain, all ablaze, thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turned into blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died. A third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel sounded his trumpet and a great star, blazing like a torch, fell from the sky on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water and the name of the star is Wormwood. A friend here reminded me that the name of Chernobyl is linked with that word. I was in Europe not too long after Chernobyl blew and everything I ate was probably tainted to some degree with the result of that explosion. And hundreds of thousands of people ultimately will be dead because of Chernobyl. And it means wormwood. I don't think that's the point of this verse, but it's interesting as something similar. The name of the star is wormwood. A third of the waters turned bitter. Many people died from the waters that had become bitter. Fourth angel sounded his trumpet. Third of the sun was struck, third of the moon, third of the stars, so that a third of them turned dark. A third of the day was without light, and also a third of the night. And as I watched, I heard an eagle, or can be translated a vulture, flying in midair, calling out in a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. You'll find there are seven woes in Revelation, just as there are seven blessings to the inhabitants of the earth because the trumpet blasts about to be sounded by the other three angels. Here are the clues to the trumpets and I should mention that the next chapter is the most graphic chapter ever written in the whole realm of literature, not just biblical but secular. Read it, but don't read it just before going to bed. I can remember when I was a boy, about 10 or 11, reading through the book of Revelation before I went to sleep and when I went to sleep I dreamt about all these horrible things. All these horrible things. So don't read chapter 9 just before you go to sleep. But read it sometime. It is the most graphic and in some senses the most awe-inspiring and terrible chapter in any literature. We won't get to it today. We'll probably have to get to it next day. Here are the clues to understanding the trumpets. We've already mentioned the Feast of Israel of the seventh month who are connected with the end, connected with judgment. But as we go through these seven trumpets, we'll find the symbols of Genesis 1 are here, but in reverse. The seven trumpets give creation turned upside down. Seven trumpets bring us the decreation of the world. So you'll find reference to earth and sea, rivers and fountains of waters, sun, moon and stars and locusts out of the pit and then horses and people and stop. All the symbolism of Genesis 1 is followed through in the seven trumpets. Also followed through in the seven last plagues with this difference that in the trumpets it'll talk about a third part, a third part. It's not universal, but the plagues are worldwide. Never uses the third part. So the clues to the trumpets, the feasts of Israel, Genesis 1, the plagues on Egypt. The plagues on Egypt included blood, fire, darkness, locusts. At least four of these trumpets use the symbolism found in the ten plagues on Egypt. So that's another hint. Another one is the story of Jericho. You remember how Jericho couldn't, couldn't be taken by an army and God said, okay, we'll do it with trumpets. And so Israel marched around it seven times and on the seventh day they blew the trumpets and an earthquake somewhere and whoosh, down fell the walls. This is saying that the seven trumpets are like that event 
at Jericho and that the Jericho of this world will fall before the trumpets of God. So that is another clue. Right, what about these first ones? First one's a symbol of war. Blood, fire, hail. Symbol of war. And the trees, what about the trees? Remember Jesus said, if they do these things in the green tree, what will they do to the dry? Trees are often used as symbol of the professed people of God. He comes to a fig tree, no fruit on it, and he says, no fruit grow on you henceforth forever. Here is a picture of the professed people of God, the Jews who have crucified Christ by their collaboration with the Romans, and they will suffer in the first trumpet when Jerusalem is destroyed. The war in AD 70, not only at Jerusalem, Caesarea, all around the Mediterranean basin. There were more than two million Jews in that old world. You know, there ought to be now over a hundred million Jews, but we Gentiles have killed them off. Isn't it strange we forget that Christ was a Jew? Isn't it strange we can forget that Abraham was a Jew, that all the prophets were Jews, that the apostles were Jews, but Gentiles have murdered the people whom God once gave the truths of the gospel. But when they rejected the Messiah, war came to Israel, and the first trumpet is a very graphic picture of the destruction of Israel in AD 70. All around the Mediterranean basin, they were killed off like flies by the thousand. Terrible, terrible experience. In Jerusalem alone, they say perhaps a million people died. Hundreds of thousands were sold into slavery. So here's a symbolism of the fruitless trees, the barren trees being burnt up in judgment. And that happened in AD 70. What about the second one? Well, the next people that oppose the Christians is the Roman Empire. And a mountain is used in Jeremiah 51 and elsewhere as a symbol of an empire. And later on in the book of Revelation, it talks about Babylon as a great mountain being thrown into the sea. So the second trumpet here about the mountain being cast down to the sea is a graphic portrayal of the destruction of the Roman Empire. Rome rejected the gospel. Paul could say, the gospel of which I am a minister has gone to every creature under heaven. Hyperbole, he meant in the known world. It had even invaded Caesar's palace. There were Christians serving Caesar, but not killing for Caesar. And how did Rome react? Well, Nero took the Christians, dipped them in bitumen, set them alight, made them beacons for his beer gardens. And all around the Roman Empire, sporadically, not an overwhelming thing convulsing all of the new church, but every now and again, outbursts, so the whole church knew they were in danger. Rome rejected the gospel, and Rome fell. It is dangerous to toy with the gospel. Israel rejected, Israel was destroyed, AD 70. Rome rejected the gospel, the barbarian tribes came down, and Rome fell, not because of the barbarians, but because it was rotten within. It had no spirit left. They'd rejected the gospel. They were empty and barren. And this picture of a huge mountain falling into the sea, very graphic picture of the destruction of the Roman Empire. What about the two that follow? We find fountains of waters and rivers suddenly becoming alien to their nature. We find sun and moon and stars alien to their nature. Something is happening. What do these things represent? Well, the rivers and fountains of waters represent the life-giving gospel. Read Ezekiel 47. Read John chapter 4, the water I shall give you. Read John 7, 37, 38, rivers of living water. It is saying that the Christian church influenced by the world around it, will become bitter, that there'll be much apostasy. And it happened. I gave you one example. Baptism. 
turn to sprinkling, adoration of saints, all sorts of holy days. Many, many things came in from paganism into the Christian church in the early century, not to be found in the Bible, just not there. And so the gospel lost its life-giving power and became the church became bitter to the world. And the light of the gospel was darkened. Surely there's something very practical here. The gospel is meant to be to us like a spring of water, cool water on a hot day. It's meant to be to us like the shining of the sun at dawn when the darkness of the night is dispatched. If you and I really believe the gospel, our sun should rise, our souls should be watered, Why do people do themselves this wrong, that they neglect the gospel, that they go through the world lonely and empty? Any life that's not committed to Christ is an empty life. Any life that's not committed to Christ is a frustrated life. You know, the only reason for this life is to prepare us for the next. Otherwise, it's a mockery. The only reason for this life is to prepare us for the next. And a person that doesn't take advantage of it, that doesn't luxuriate in the springs of living water, in the sunshine of the love of God. You know, the sunshine is a wonderful picture of the love of God. It shines through the kitchen window, even on cracked crockery. It shines on garbage. You and I can't do that. If we put icing on a heap of manure, it doesn't become a cake. But when the gospel shines on a sinful heart, it can change it into sweetness. So while third and fourth trumpets point to the apostasy in Christianity that brought bitterness and curtailed the light of the gospel, its practical meaning is for you and me today that I should ask myself, hey, Do I walk in the sunshine of the love of God? Yes, there are shadows, but nights are not forever. Yes, there's death, but after death comes resurrection. Yes, there's a caterpillar that clings to the earth, but after a while it's a butterfly. Can I read life with the hope of the gospel and thereby luxuriate in the rivers and fountains of the Holy Spirit, in the sunshine of the love of God. Let's pray. Thank you for these very practical prophecies that challenge us about our daily walk. Give us light to understand them. Help us read aright the symbols of our daily walk that they may remind us of gospel themes because we know it's true that whatever gets our attention gets us. Thank you, you love us. Thank you, you brought us here today. Thank you, your spirit has spoken to us today. Help us to walk with thee, one day at a time, rejoicing in Christ. Amen.